It is with great honor today to be interviewing Harvey Levy, and we uh, we share something in common. We both earned our MAGD. How are you doing today, Harvey? Wonderful. I'm glad to be here. And the uh, first time we met was when you and I both spoke at the uh, Virginia Dental Association in November 19, uh, 2009. You did one day, and I did the next day. You were walking around with a boot, and so you had everybody doing your work for you. I had to do all my own work. Oh, that's <laughs> it was, right. It was November of 2009, Virginia DA. Man, that, that seems like a long time years. ago. Hey, I want to start. Um, you, um, I, I want to start with just a lot of people will uh, see the MAGD, and the, these podcasts are watched around the world in every single country. Um, tell people what does MAGD mean, and why did you spend so much time earning one? Well, I'm just proud to be part of the Academy of General Dentistry, where after fellowship. One continues the journey of uh, being a perpetual student, takes more courses, participation and lecture, uh, can do some teaching and writing if you choose to, and then you become a master in the Academy of General Dentistry. But the journey doesn't end there. It goes on to the next level, which is LLSR. That's Lifelong Learning and Service Recognition. Wow, I was so the in... MHED goes on. The MHED goes on. And they also part don't, of the journey. Don't, don't they also also have a, a now a board certified general dentist? Yes, they do. I have not participated in the board. Uh, military people do very well with that. Uh, in private practice, uh, I chose to go the other route, which is lifelong learning and service, which is similar to another master's, but it also includes service to the community, whether it's to patients, pro bono work, and or service to the dental professionals by serving on boards and committees and doing things without remuneration. Well, Harvey, one of the reasons I was so excited to talk to you today is that, um, you know, every dentist knows that uh, probably the two biggest barriers to entry uh, for a patient to go to the the dentist is going to be fear and finance. I mean, are you going to hurt me and how much is it going to cost? And you are an expert and you have really spent a lot of time on treating an anxious patient and a lot of, a lot of dentists, they, they don't even want an anxious patient. Uh, how did you get interested in that? And what would you tell about 7,000 dentists listening to you right now? Um, how, do you, how do you treat anxious patients? And why do you even go out looking for that challenge? Wouldn't you rather uh, advertise, uh, hey, I want rich people who love to go to the dentist. I don't want poor people who are afraid. Well, let me bifurcate that because you're asking me two parts in one sentence. First, you say, why do I do it? And then how should they do it? Why do I do it, and how do I advise other people? The question is this. Why would patients drive past 10 other offices to get to yours? What do you offer that they don't? How do you create a niche where you offer something that your competitors or colleagues don't? And in realizing that the two barriers that keep patients away are fear and finances, if you can overcome their fear by offering something that reduces their their anxiety, then the patients will drive past 10, 20, 30 other offices to come to yours. In our office, we offer office oral sedation. We don't give any IM or IV, although I commend people to do that. Uh, we give oral sedation and or nitrous oxide. And we've done that about 36,000 times. We have a 96% success rate for doing that. The other thing that we make available that the other people between my office and their homes don't offer is hospital uh, dentistry. If we fail in an office, and we have failed 4% of the time, we take them to the operating room, and I just do what I do best, which is my general dentistry. I bring my hygienist and assistant. The anesthesiologist puts the patient to sleep, and all I do is my same general dentistry under ideal conditions. The patient is asleep, uh, and I work faster, more effectively, more efficiently. It's a much higher profit margin, and the patient gets a service that they could not possibly get under any other circumstances when they're asleep. So what I'm trying to say is we overcome their fear first by offering office sedation. In my office, it's just oral pills, liquid, or get laughing gas. And if we fail, we'll take them to the operating room and offer it under outpatient general anesthesia. And that we've done 1,600 times, Howard. So I know a lot of people are wondering right now, will you talk about your oral sedation and your nitrous oxide protocol? It'd be my pleasure. Two important rules, empty stomach, empty bladder. I've, given a lect- I've lectured about 125 times, and I drive this point home. Empty stomach, empty bladder, because I don't want anybody 
peeing, pooping, or puking anywhere in my office. So if they're on an empty stomach, this, they can retro all they want, but they're not going to throw up. It's a non-productive throw up. An empty bladder or pull up diaper or depends because we don't want them peeing or saying they have to pee or pooping and say they have to poop. We just call it bluff. Nothing comes out because empty stomach, empty bladder. Uh, that way, when we give them the nitrous or sedation and their muscles are relaxed, nothing productive comes out of their bladder or their stomach, and we can succeed about 96% of the time. The other 4% are usually patients who are somewhere in the autistic spectrum where they say, don't touch me, don't touch me, or they're so medically compromised that it's too dangerous to do it in an office setting. So those autistic, special needs, and Alzheimer's patients, we're more successful in a safe hospital setting where the last thing they remember is somebody gave them a kiss on the cheek and said goodnight, and two hours later they wake up, all the dentistry is done, and they have no idea how it got done. Nice. So um, how do you administer nitrous oxide? What uh, there, are two tip there are two protocols that we can use either one. Uh, the ADA has one, and the nitrous oxide uh, companies like Porter Instrument have another. Uh, one protocol would be you start them off with pure oxygen for a few minutes, oxygenate the lungs well, and then slowly titrate up the nitrous, go to 10%, then 20 then 30 then 50 and then using finger gestures, yes, no, yes, no. Do you want to go higher? If they say yes, I can go to 60 or even 70. The machines cap off at 70% nitrous oxide. Uh, and then after we finish the case, we oxygenate them well so they don't have any diffusion of noxia uh, where they, uh, nox, nitrous leaves before oxygen arrives. So we start and finish with pure oxygen for a few minutes. And after we take off the mask, within a few minutes, it's completely blown out of the system and they can even drive home if they didn't take some sedation pills. So nitrous oxide is a wonderful and safe and inexpensive sedation that has a very high success rate. Are you surprised at how many dentists and endodontists and specialists do not have this? Uh, it, it startles me. In fact, I uh, lectured to uh, 350 endodontists uh, last month at the AAE convention, and uh, out of the 350 endodontists in the room, two of them were using it. And I was pr proposing to them that this could be a practice builder for them as well, where why would a patient drive by other general officers to get to your endodontic office? The answer is because you do better endo than them. Okay, why would they drive past other endodontic offices to go to yours? And the answer is if you offer oral sedation, nitrous oxide and or pills, then patients would drive past your competitors to come to your office, and that seemed to have been well received. I mean, but to me that, um, you know, if you're patient-focused, how could you be an endodontist and not have nitrous oxide? I mean, that just really blows my mind. It startles me also, which is by once or twice a month, my partners and I are doing, doing endo cases in the OR, we know that our success rate is not as high as the endodontist. We don't, uh, we don't pretend it is. We have our success rate, which is the same as any average general dentist, uh, but we can do it while they're sedated in the office or asleep in the hospital operating room. The only difference is we do not have microscopes. We cannot bring a microscope to the operating room. So we do the best we can with what we've got. We get very good, maybe even excellent results, but no, it's not gonna be at the same caliber as an endodontist in an endodontic office under a microscope. So um, how does a dentist go into a hospital and do dentistry? Do you, you, you have to have hospital privileges or does the anesthesiologist do this for you? How do you take in your instruments? Do you, did you rig out an operatory in a hospital? How, how do you do this? Excellent question, Howard. Thank you for asking. Uh, first, let me compare it to getting an office sedation permit. To get a sedation permit in an office, one must jump through a number of hoops, including taking a course, uh, having a, uh, a site visit, having medicines, having a, uh, uh, paying a fee, being ACLS certified, just to be, have the opportunity to give office sedation. To go to the hospital, it's 100 times easier. All you have to do is fill out an application with your name and address, prove you are who you say you are. You might have to pay a small fee because some receptionist has to verify your credentials. The hardest thing I have to do to get hospital privileges is, don't laugh now, prove to the nurse that I know how to scrub and wash my hands. If I can get by the nurse uh, scrubbing my hands, the rest is easy. You just need a basic life support, not even advanced, just a BCLS card and an application, and boom, you're in the hospital on staff. And that would, um, that 
that's standard of care in a hospital. Like I, I still, you know, when you, when you travel around the world, I mean, I've had, had so many dentists from other countries say, you know, um, in your country, if you go in and get surgery on the heart, the cardiovascular surgeon can't do the anesthesia and the heart surgery. You have to have an anesthesiologist, but they, 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 they always point out the discrepancy that oral surgeons are the only surgeons who do the anesthesia and do the surgery, and that's just not how it's done in a hospital. Would you say, would you say standard of care for general anesthesia should be hospitalization with an anesthesiologist in a hospital for the maximum, um, you know, in case something goes wrong? Uh, yes, as long as you add a nurse anesthetist, because some hospitals have a nurse anesthetist with one anesthesiologist monitoring, let's say, several nurse anesthetists. So they will monitor it. But I want to do what I do best, which is my general dentistry, and let somebody else take care of the heart and lungs. This way the patient is safely, safely put to sleep by an anesthesiologist or anesthetist. Then my staff and I do what we do best, but more effectively, more efficiently, more profit margin, more successfully. Uh, and then let the anesthesiologist wake up the patient and the work is done in a situation where it could not possibly have been done in an office setting. We have about 900 new patients a year, most of them are by word of mouth, not from the sedated patients, but from the lover, loved ones, the caregivers, the families of these patients that we successfully treated either in the office under by sedation or in the hospital under outpatient general anesthesia. And how do you log logistically take a high speed and a hand speed and suction and, and how, how do you do a root canal in some in some place other than your dental office? How do you get it? How, how does that work? Well, as I said, I do, I do not have a microscope to bring to the hospital. The only thing I bring to the hospital besides my own staff is anything unique to that patient, such as the denture that I'm going to insert, the space maintainer, uh, the implant, the crown, the bridge, uh, all the routine material that's repetitive is already in the facility. Uh, we gave the hospital a list of things we'd like them to purchase. We say, pretend this operating room is a dental operatory. Here are the things we'd like you to purchase. And the only thing that we bring with us is anything unique to that particular patient. I also bring my laptop because I like to take x-rays. So the hospital has three different types of x-ray systems, uh, uh, but you know, a handheld and a roll-in, but I have my own laptop. So we take x-rays in the OR, develop it instantly. I use Dexas. Uh, we develop the uh, images instantly, and we develop our treatment plan and diagnosis, and we jump right into work immediately. Uh, we do have a backup system we use called ergonomic self-developing film. That's a case of a computer failure. And about twice a year, I really need the backup system. I boast to my, uh, during my core courses, I say this. This may surprise you, but I do not have backup to every system. Pause, pause, pause. I have a backup to every backup. Because if the backup fails, I don't want to say, oh, sugar, I'm in trouble. I want to go to the backup to the backup. And that little bit of an additional expense will save me from major expenses later on. So the hospital has your high speeds and slow speeds and, and all that stuff? I mean, they're, they're plumb like a dental mm -hmm. operatory? Everything is mobile or portable. In fact, they recently wrote a, a chapter, let me show this to you, a book on geriatric dentistry, and my chapter is called Portable Dentistry, and we talk about both mobile and portable. Paula Friedman's the uh, main author, but my chapter's on portable dentistry, either in a home, nursing home, hospital or surgical center, hospice, etc. So in a facility that maintains the equipment, we just have it wheeled in. The mobile dental carts, the x-ray units, it's, it's just wheeled in and it stays right there. I don't own it and I don't have to schlep or carry it because the hospital wheels it in. Uh, the only thing I bring is what's unique to that patient. So they have everything in duplicate because if they have a cart and there's an air hose leakage, I don't want to have to abort the case because of a leakage. I don't want to be able to say, get me the backup cart or the backup handpiece, the backup hose, the backup x-ray unit. So you just showed your book, Geriatric Dentistry. When does that come out, and where can uh, our listeners get that book? Okay. Well, this book is already it came out a few months ago by Paula Friedman. Uh, and if anybody goes to my website, just Google my name, Dr. Harvey Levy, Maryland. It will show you my 25 publications. All of them are free to download, except those that are in book form you have to obtain separately. And if they do take a look at that, they'll see two things that you might be familiar with, Howard. Can I show this to you? 
two of the articles that I wrote for Dental Town, uh, you, you courtesy published for me. Uh, one was in 2013, the other was 2010. And this is one of my greatest marketing tools because you uh, allowed me to obtain reprints of these two articles that I give out at all my courses. One is called Circuit Training. It talks about a dozen different things that I use to make me successful at office setting. And the other you published for me is called uh, Debunking the Myths of Special Needs Patient Care, where we talk about how the myths of fear and finances are debunked point by point. Those were article great articles. Also in my courses. And your website, and I thank you for allowing me your, your website is uh, drhlevyassociate.com. So drhlevy. A-S-S-O-C.com. So Dr. H. Levy, associate.com. Yes, but if it's too many letters, just Google my name. It'll take you right to my site anyway. Which Dr. is Harvey, Harvey Levy, H-A-R-V-E-Y, L-E-V-Y, Harvey Levy, Maryland. Yes, there's only one other. The only other one is a physician in Boston, and uh, he's a geneticist, and I'm a dentist, so we don't, we don't get each other's mail. That's funny. The only two Harvey Levy's, and they're both, uh, they're both doctors. You think you, you, think you guys sure? are, you think you guys are related? Uh, no, because he has a middle name and I don't. <laughs> oh, really? You don't, don't have a middle so. name? Uh, my wife jokes that since my parents never gave me a middle name, I went and got a whole bunch of initials after my name to compensate for that. That's I think a, it's a family. That's joke, a, yeah. Um, I always thought it was interesting that President Harry S. Truman. Everybody always say, "What was his? What did S. stand for?" S. was his name. It was just an S. It was Harry S. Truman. That was the whole middle name. Um, interesting. Um, so on this uh, oral sedation, um, talk, what do you only use one medication, or do you use different types of medication? Will you talk about that? Of course. Uh, anyone who only has one tool is, uh, is I think, foolish. Uh, part of my preaching at my courses is to take more courses to expand your portfolio so you're offering and doing more. Uh, we have our favorites. In fact, uh, all three of my partners and I have our favorites. But we like the benzodiazepine paints because the benzodiazepines, which is Halcyon, uh, Valium, Ativan, and Versed, they're easily reversed by uh, a reversal agent, the Romasicon, the Flamazenil. We've never used the reversal agent, but we're prepared to in case we have a benzodiazepine overdose or a hypotension. There are other medicines that we like to use besides the four benzodiazepines. Say the, say the four de- use, benzodiazepines yeah, again. Okay. Uh, um, Halcyon, triazolam, Valium, diazepam, Lorazepam, uh, which is Ativan, and Midazolam, which is Versed. Those are four, four benzodiazepines that we commonly use. The only differentiation is that Versed only comes in a liquid form. The other three comes in liquid or pills. We give liquid to the children and pills to the adults in an office setting. So they can drink the liquid? Yes. In fact, uh, more than 1,000 of my 1,600 OR cases began with giving some Versed with a little juice or syrup uh, or something to drink uh, so that the patient was calm enough so that we can then start an IV or give them the mask. When I say we, I'm referring to the anesthesia team. I'm just in the room watching and taking pictures and videos, but I don't participate in that. That's the domain of the anesthesiologist or anesthetist. They give them some percent to drink or the other three mixtures. Uh, then they're relaxed enough for the anesthesiologist then put on the mask, then start the IV, or start the IV, then put on the mask. This is followed by an intubation. Uh, usually it's nasal intubation so that I can work for as many hours as I want to and the patient stays safely and calmly asleep. And do you do, and, um, and what was the other family you were talking about, the other family drugs? Uh, for years I used chloral hydrate and Atarax because they were so synergistic. The chloral hydrate was taken off the market a number of years ago. So we still use Atarax, but we use that in conjunction with one of the other liquids for people who don't like to take pills. And why was, system. and why did they take chlorohydrate off the market? My understanding, this is uh, somebody may correct me if I'm wrong. There was a legal case a number of years ago where two children died of what was thought to be chlorohydrate overdoses, and so they stopped producing the chlorohydrate. But after the trials were completed, it turned out they both died of lidocaine toxicity, 
and the chloral hydrate were merely incidental findings. But as you know, once they stop producing something, they're not going to start the presses up again. So chloral hydrate is no longer in common use because of the two cases where people were thought to die of chloral hydrate, but it was in fact lidocaine toxicity. You know, we had a so we, for, we have substitutes now. We had a lidocaine uh, death out here in Phoenix about five years ago. Um, um, the dentist just it was a kid, and they needed worked in all four quadrants and gave four carpules and uh, dropped them. Uh, dosage is everything. Um, how do you do? You, um, talk about that. It's it's all weight dependent. I mean, you go by weight. I mean, when someone says, "I always give someone fifteen milligrams of this," that that's not accurate. I mean, it's it's milligram per kilogram of body weight, right? Yes, but please realize that if we've raised somebody's pain threshold, either with nitrous oxide, one of the benzodiazepines, we can give much less local anesthetic. And when I'm in the operating room, I use no local anesthetic whatsoever, unless there's an extraction where I want to use it for hemostasis. But in the OR, unless I'm doing surgery, I do not use local anesthesia. And in the office, we use less than we would use under normal circumstances if they're sedated with a higher threshold of pain. You said you, um, um, on the nitrous oxide, uh, you, you mentioned a porter unit. Um, have you heard or seen where they're talking about now going a, a, to a nasal cannula instead of having a mask over your nose, uh, slipping a tube up your nose? Have you seen anything about that? Yes, uh, I have, I've seen it. We use it in the hospital, but it's not well received in the office. Instead, Porter Instrument has come up with something called the Silhouette, uh, which is a very, very flat, narrow profile. Up until now, I had to get my hand all the way around the mask to get to the mouth, and the mask also precluded wearing glasses. And if I want the safety glasses for protection or prevention, for dropping things in the eyes, uh, it would be a problem. But their new silhouette mask is so flat, they can wear glasses, and I, it just barely hovers over the nose and... Uh, the flatter profile makes it a lot more appealing. But we have not started using the nasal natal cannula because I see how poorly received it is in the hospital setting, but they don't have a choice there. So, no, I've not done it, but, um, uh, but I've seen it. So, how do, so, okay, so you're talking to about 7,000 people. Most of them are uh, commuting to work. A, lo a lot of the podcast fans have an hour commute to work each day. They're driving to work, and they're saying, you know what, I don't do this, Harvey. I've never done it. What would be the next step for someone to just go from, I've never done oral sedation to now I'm going to try to do an oral sedation case? What would you recommend? How they, what would be the next step of this journey after you're giving them the message, this is something they want to do, what should they do next? Take a course, then take another course, then take another course. And the course is available everywhere through the universities, through the American Society, uh, Dental Anesthesia Society, Society of Dental Anesthesia, uh, Doc's Office courses. There are courses offered everywhere. First the basic courses, then more advanced. Uh, I, I offer basic, basic courses myself. I have the 12-hour course that I offer several times a year. I offer through the Academy of General Dentistry. It's a 12-hour course every year, uh, New Jersey Health Professionals Development Institute. Many state meetings will call me in for an 8- or 12-hour course. And the bulk of the course is how to succeed in an office setting using nitrous oxide and some sedation medicine. And if you've failed with that, come back after lunch or come back the next day. We'll talk about doing the work with guaranteed success in the OR. I need to clarify, when I say guaranteed success, I am not talking about specific performance. I will never guarantee to be uh, to successfully save a tooth of the root canal or get the tooth out in one piece. I'm saying I guarantee that I will finish the case that we pre-planned uh, because flailing about is not uh, a variable when they're asleep. They're completely asleep and I will complete the case that I started, but I do not guarantee specific performance. Harvey, we've put up uh, 317 courses on Dentaltown, and they've been viewed half a million times. I wish you would put up your uh, course on uh, Dentaltown. Have you ever thought about putting it up online? Well, we did do several courses. Um, I have four courses that are available online. Three of them were through dentaledu.tv, which was just bought out by uh, University um, in, uh, in, in Naples, Florida. So they're going to be reposting those. I do have a one-hour webinar that's free for everybody called Access to Care. Uh, that's through Viva Learning, and that's free for anybody if they want to see how we succeed uh, and improve our access to care. But how I would love to do some work with you as well because you've been so gracious with me all these years, and you've been a gentleman uh, in 
printing my articles, and I did post a few comments on Dental Town. So, so you, I'm a fan of yours. Oh, thanks, buddy. You said Dental Edu. Dent, yeah, the, what? Dental Edu TV was just bought out by Nova, N O V A University, and in, they're in, the in Fort Lauderdale, of Florida. It. Exactly. Yes. Oh and wow. The people, and uh, Albert Whitehead and Linda um, and uh, Linda Neeson are uh, going through the legal uh, requirements to have it uh, made available to the general public. Wow. So I have three course three course of what is office sedation, a separate course is hospital dentistry, and the third one is uh, exodontia with very few fractures and um, no risk fatigue. That's a whole separate course. I've, le- I've, levered, lectured at, uh, I've levered at Nova in uh, Florida several times. Um, do you email those two guys? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, Linda Neeson was here with me in Maryland, and I actually took her seat when she left Maryland uh, to her seat as the, um, on the Maryland State Dental Association's Council of Dental Health. And Bart Whitehead and I have been corresponding, anxiously awaiting for my three courses to be posted and made available. Will you send them an email and CC me, Howard at Dentaltown.com, and I'll see, is there any ways we can network together or anything like that? I, w- I suspect they would welcome the opportunity to collaborate and cooperate because it's a win-win for everybody, Howard. Yeah, and I think the world of Linda, I think she's great. And the other one was Viva Learning? Yeah, Viva Learning is the, uh, a lot of free courses uh, uh, that anybody can log on to Viva, V-I-V-A Learning. Uh, they have many, many uh, free courses. Where's that at? Is, uh, one of them. Uh, is that a US, uh, U.S. company or? Yeah, that's. Oh, huh. don't know how to, I don't have to answer that. But if anybody uh, uh, enters Viva Learning, V I V A Learning, they'll be made of uh, uh, they'll be exposed to nearly a thousand courses. Many of them are free, including my one credit course. Mine was sponsored by Dental Ease because I was talking about the use of the hovercraft chair and working with wheelchair patients who don't want to get out of their wheelchair. Either they don't, they don't want to or they can't. I have many patients who are either obese, double amputees. Alzheimer's who don't want to get out, autistic patients who say, don't touch me. So we leave them in the comfort of their wheelchair, and we move our operatory chair with a push of a finger because it's all hovercraft technology. We have nine of these dental these chairs that we can move to the side of the room or out of the room so that our patients can stay in the comfort of their wheelchair without ever having to get out. That is, that is, that is so amazing. Um, very, very amazing. So um, – on dental town, or a lot, a lot of people ask about the doc scores because they, they do a lot of advertising, a lot of marketing. Probably every listener uh, that's listening to us right now uh, has got a, an email or seen an advertisement of docs. What do you think of docs? What is docs? Talk about docs. You talked about universities. You talked about online. What's docs all about? Uh, docs is up. Uh, uh, first of all, I have to as a disclaimer, I have both a fellowship and diplomate in, with docs, so I'm already biased. I have a friendship, a working relationship with both Mike Silverman and um, Tony Feck. So I've taken their courses, and I'm a diplomat. So I'm an advocate and proponent of docs, but they don't host or sponsor my programs. Uh, We did collaborate uh, in the past, and I do promote them. And they have a – when I offer my courses, I say, if you want to learn more, you can take the docs course, which is three days. You can take their IV courses also, but I'm talking about the oral sedation. Uh, dental schools offer it. American Dental Anesthesia Society, Society of Dental Anesthesia, offers wonderful courses. Uh, but docs is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Uh, I do have to say, I don't want it to give anybody a false sense of confidence that they can go out and conquer any case Monday morning. But it's a wonderful follow-up to my very basic cases, where docs offers a two or three-day program that teaches a lot more than I do in my limited course. And uh, the people are wonderful. Um, the, the, the doctors who lecture for the course are just top-notch and knowledgeable. Dr. Fang and uh, Eugene Pester, these are just top people. Do you know the website URL for Docs Sedation? Uh, I think it's Docs Education, D-O-C-S Education. And what, and what does Docs stand for, D-O-C-S? That's uh, Oral Conscious Sedation. Oral conscious sedation. Doctors using oral conscious sedation. Uh, they do offer IV programs also, but right now uh, I'm just talking about uh, what is the best protocol for oral sedation? What combination of pills and or nitrous oxide? And I use them synergistically in a combination for me to yield my 96% success rate. 
I also want to. I also want to ask you. Um, you you said the word uh, autistic autism a couple of times. Uh, tell Dennis what they need. Uh, tell Dennis, tell Dennis what they need to think about or know about autism. We have a two thousand special on these patients, and I put them in two categories: the predictable and the unpredictable. With the predictable patients, I know that um, uh, this medicine will work, or this restraint will work, or this protocol will work. And we're successful in, in, uh, in monitoring it and predicting from visit to visit. With autistic patients, the analogy is this. If you've seen one autistic patient, you've seen one autistic patient. Each one is so unique and so different. And more often than not, it's counterintuitive to what you would think. Normally, we uh, could use the Budweiser approach, which uh, jokingly is a little is good, more is better, and too much is just about right. <laughs> my autistic with my autistic spectrum patients, somehow there's a rebound whiplash reversal effect where the more sedation I give, the more combative and uncooperative they become. So I have a large failure rate in, uh, in being successful in an office setting with my autistic patients, and many of them end up being successfully and safely treated in a hospital setting because they're under general anesthesia. All they know is that mom or dad gave them a kiss on the cheek and they wake up and all the work got done. There's no psychological harms or repercussions, repercussions of being held down or restrained. And the work, we do our finest work on sleeping patients. That includes all of the autism, autism spectrum patients. You know, you, you talk about <clears throat> oral sedation and nitrous oxide, and I think every dentist listening knows those terms and is familiar with the, sub, the, the, the terms. But you also use the terms... Um, using body wraps and props. What do those terms mean to you? And, I, and I, I would venture the majority of our listeners have never heard of body wraps and props. In okay. Well, let me convert uh, the standard image of a straitjacket. Now, take the straitjacket, but make it rainbow-colored, and make it all Velcro, no metal, no clasp. It's just a gentle, gentle restraint. Um, it's made by a specialized care company, which makes some of the best products for what I do. Uh, and they have seven different sizes of what looks like a colorful blanket. We put this colorful blanket on the operatory chair but before the patient is even seated. So they don't sit on the chair. They sit on this colorful rainbow wrap. Once they're seated, somebody will put very gentle, colorful Velcro and cloth bracelets around the hand. And then we wrap it together. And right now, it's not threatening uh, because it's just a huggly, hugging, snuggly type of uh, situation. And they find that they're no longer able to flail their hands and hit my staff or themselves for self-injurious behavior. Once the hands are wrapped and restrained, we can then also restrain the head and the feet, so they're not going to create any injurious behavior to themselves or my staff. Uh, and then it's just a matter of immobilizing the head, propping the mouth open, and getting the work done. So we use rainbow wraps uh, two to three dozen times every week on patients who either have controlled movements, they're trying to squat on us, or uncontrolled movements. Patients with Huntington's disease or some sort of uh, forms of cerebral palsy where they are unable to control their hand flailing movements. And is this company, is that, are all their customers dentists? I mean, are they, is this a dental specialty or is this, they sell this to other, other people too? I think uh, dentists and pediatricians would both benefit from this, but any uh, emergency rooms have it also. Um, it's like the old PD wrap uh, or the PD board, but there's no cardboard, wood, or metal. It's all non-threatening mesh and Velcro. And in my courses, I always take the largest person in the room. I wrap them up in this, and I say, if you can get out of this, I will pay for your course. And in 125 courses, nobody has ever gotten out of what looks like just a piece of cloth, mesh, and Velcro. It's that effective. But they're, they're probably not trying to get out because since you have uh, nine black belts and in the Black Belt Hall of Fame, they're probably afraid <laughs> that you would drop kick them and knock them out if they, uh, if they tried to get out. <laughs> what? That's true but irrelevant. I didn't know that you knew that. <laughs> <laughs> so what, that, that, that is amazing. Tell, tell us about your karate background. <laughs> The passions of my life are my work, my workout, and my family. I love my work. I've been doing this since 1974, and I'm as enthusiastic now as I was on day one. Uh, but what keeps me so active and energized is that I 
been training for an hour a day for the last 51 years, and I just tested for my 10th black belt. I'm still in the process of testing, and yeah, I, I was inducted into the Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Uh, but that has a dental application also, because in my courses, I teach martial arts techniques to open the mouths of an uncooperative patient by using pressure points. For example, if you touch your chin button, um, in the martial application, we use that to force somebody's chin away from you at a 45 degree angle down. So you first have to mobilize the forehead, vibrate the chin button 45 degrees down, and it's very hard to resist that opening. In a martial application, we used it to get out of somebody choking you. But in the dental application, we immobilize the head, push the chin button, which is called Conception 24 on the pressure point, vibrate it down, and about 98% of the patients will open by doing that. The other 2% I have to distract by touching another pressure point on a different part of the body, either the thumb or triple warm or 17 or some other points that we use to distract them the mind goes to the other part of the body that you're physically touching, and they say to themselves, what is going on over there? So that by thinking about what the other part of the body I'm physically touching, they're no longer able to resist this forced opening. And once we open them, we put in any of the many mouth props or gags or blocks that we use to keep them open. So getting them open is one thing, and then putting in, inserting a prop to keep them open allows us to examine the other side of the mouth. After we've done our exam or treatment or whatever we need to do, we then rotate the prop to the opposite side, and we work on this side. It's hard to work bilaterally. That we usually have to go to the operating room for bilateral. But we can use unilateral, the switch, then we go to the other side. But you're right. We do use martial application uh, for touching certain pressure points, conception 24, triple warmer 17, or points on the fingertip. Uh, pushing the base of the nail at 90 degrees will distract the patient just long enough for us to then succeed in uh, opening the mouth of an uncooperative or unwilling patient. Now, that's very interesting. Very interesting. Um, <clears throat> speaking of martial arts, I got one, mar one martial arts question. Uh, you and I, back in the day, the biggest sport was um, boxing. And it was Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier and all the greats, uh, Ernie yeah. Shavers, all, all those guys. And now it's uh, uh, HBO boxing is really taking a backseat to the UFC, which is a mix of uh, karate and wrestling and boxing. What, what do you think of that journey from uh, HBO boxing, Muhammad Ali, to now the UFC? It's, uh, I love the question. It's nothing to do with dentistry, but let me tell you about my own journey. Uh, I was always the shortest kid on the block. I'm barely five foot seven, and I was never picked for basketball. If I was picked for basketball, I was the ball. If I was picked for baseball, I was the, the base. For football, I was the ball. So I was never involved in those sports. But by being short, I was able to be. Uh, I was able to use uh, well the prowess of martial arts. Where, well, let me phrase it differently. How can a hundred pound girl fling a three hundred pound man across the room effortlessly, repeatedly, and without breaking a sweat? It's all anatomy and physics. So with the proper knowledge of anatomy and physics. I could take on people twice my size. I trained twice a week for three hours each. Every Wednesday and Sunday, I trained for three hours. And everyone I trained with is half my age and twice my size. Yet I prevail most of the time because I have knowledge of anatomy and physics that these young, strong guys don't have. Uh, so in my martial arts career, I have third degree black belts in three different <laughs> styles. So... Punching and kicking is only good to a certain degree. I'm not going to outpunch somebody who's much bigger than me. Uh, when I see an opponent, I see a tree. I'm not going to attack the tree. I'll see the arms. That's a branch. I'm not going to attack the branch. And then I see the fingertips. That's a twig. If I, can, if I have your twig, if I have your fingers, I have control over your entire body. If I have control over your trachea, your Adam's apple, I have control over your entire body. So it's not strength. It's knowledge of anatomy and physics. And it's... Uh, some of the greatest um, fighters are not, are not the biggest, strongest guys. It's the Brazilian grapplers because they know how to get you in an arm bar or a choke. And I've been training Brazilian jiu-jitsu for many years. I'm built in that as well. 85% of the fights end up on the ground. My ground fighting is you're on the ground and I'm not. So I love fighting with people who are bigger and stronger than me. 
My son-in-law to be a six foot eight, three twenty, big, strong football player. But if I have his finger, I have control over the fight and over the situation. You know, there the the um, I think this has a lot to do with dentistry because the uh, when I was at UMKC, the oral the the lady in oral surgery that was showing everybody how to remove teeth was this little Susan Wires, this cute little girl. <laughs> And she was just this little bitty cute thing, and my God, she could pull any tooth known to man. You have these big old guys, I can't get it, I can't get it. They'd be grabbing it and wrenching the jaw, but she knew leverage. She knew elevators, and she said, and and in her mind, she wanted to get out 99% of all teeth with just a periosteal and a small elevator, you know, elevators. And, I mean, she, she saw reaching for a forceps as just damn near a failure. And then and then and then if she had to use a forcep, that's where it stopped. A one fifty or one fifty one. There was nothing else. And her instructor, Matt Horrigan, um served yes. you remember Matt Horgan? Uh, uh, by, by reputation. Yeah. He, by reputation. He, when he was in Korea, the whole time as an oral surgeon, they only had a small large elevator and a one fifty to one fifty one. And he's like you know, every soldier was a young kid with wisdom teeth problems. He goes, okay, that's all I had for four years. Why Why do you have to lay out 30 different, different forceps to pull a tooth? He goes, he goes and, and Susan Wire, but Susan Wire was, was, was that little fighter. I mean, she, uh-huh. she just, you never saw a tricep pop out. You never saw her sweat. You never saw it. She just used leverage. She knew anatomy and she knew leverage and she, uh, she got out every tooth. She taught me an amazing month. And both of those people I mentioned, are no longer with us. That is one of the bummer getting 50, 52. Yeah. Your uh, friends and mentors and idols are starting to disappear. So what else? Um, so I, I want to I want to change change course. Um, completely change course. You've been doing this since seventy. You graduated in uh, seventy six, or, uh, or Tufts seventy four. And Tufts, Tufts is 74. in Boston. Yes, Tufts seventy four. So that means you're uh, you're Irish Catholic and graduated with a pint of whiskey in your hand. Is that true? <laughs> <laughs> I'm uh, so, no, but I'm. But my first partner was I was Irish Catholic, and it was McMahon and Levy. So for three years, I was an honorary Irishman. But he called the office McLevy's. <laughs> um, my, my my question is: since since you've been in this uh, game a long time, how many years you've been practicing, or how many years since dental school? Well, since '74. Then I did a residency. Then I did another residency. So from, the, from 1976 till now is uh, I can't do the math. But from '74 to so 2015. 2015. So 41 years. 41, 41 years. So we just had 5,000 kids walk out of 56 American dental schools. And what would advise? What What do you know? Four decades of doing this that you think they don't? Because right now you and I know that they don't even know what they don't know. So right <laughs> now they think they know what's ahead of them. They, they don't even. They, they don't know what they don't know. What advice? If that was your uh, granddaughter walking out of that school, class of 2015. What would you tell your granddaughter as she entered dentistry, and what she, uh, what, what advice would you give her? Okay. I'm glad you asked me that. But let me answer it this way. I have a five prong approach because I've talked and discussed this with people in my courses. Number one, be a sponge. Sponge, absorb as much as you can. Next, be a crab. Keep your hands out of your pocket. Touch things. Do things. So if you're a sponge, now you're a crab. Next two things are be a student and be a teacher. Be a student. Be a perpetual student. Take a course. Take another course. Take more courses. Don't stop taking courses. It's a lifelong journey. It doesn't end a year after school. But the fourth thing is to be a teacher because in my life, the best way to learn something is to have to teach it. You don't know something until you have to teach it to somebody else. So... You're a sponge, you're a crab, you're a student, you're a teacher, and the pinnacle is niche. Create a niche. Do something that the other 10 dentists in your neighborhood don't do so that the patients will drive past their office to get to yours. I'm not saying what your niche should be, but but do something that they don't do. For me, it's seeing anxious special needs patients, offering oral sedation, offering hospital anesthesia, because patients will drive for an hour radius, drive past many cities, many towns, hundreds or thousands of dentists to come to my office because I offer something that all the others don't. Why else would they come to me? I'm not the best looking or the youngest or the handsomest or the cheapest fees. I'm offering something they don't. 
So find something that you're passionate about, make it your niche, and be better than the dentist next on either side of you. Okay, I um, I hear them talking on dental ten all day long. So I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna throw that this is the mud they're gonna throw at, throw at you. They're gonna say. Yeah, but Harvey, I graduated $250,000 in student loans. You, you probably didn't even have student loans. What would you say to that? I don't understand the question. Oh, no, they're, they're, I, I, they're, I hear they're, what you're saying. I'm not sure. they're, they're saying, a lot of them are saying that, um, that our age generation people graduated with hardly any student loans. Dental school was much cheaper, much less expensive, and they just feel almost victimized that they're walking out of school – Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in student loans. What would, what financial advice would you give give them if, if a kid come out of school and they were two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in debt? And a lot of things on their mind is they think, well, if I go into an office, do I? You know, I'm already two hundred fifty thousand dollars in student loans. Um, if I bought a Cirac machine, a CAD CAM machine, that's another one hundred fifty. If I bought a CBCT three D X ray machine, that's another one hundred fifty. Um, if I bought a water lace laser, that's 75000 I could walk out of school and buy three things and double my indebtedness. What would, do, you, do you think they should buy them anyway, double down? Do you think they should open their own practice? Do you think they should be an associate and get out of debt, join the military for four years, work at corporate dentistry? What, what advice would you give them to address specifically their $250,000 in student loans? In my lectures, I talk about the expensive equipment, and I show the wrap, which is about $150, and I've used it about a 1,000 times, so it's a penny per usage. The, the disposable props, it's two tongue depressors wrapped in foam, cost me $1. If I use 25 a week, it's $25, and that's making me more successful, and it's very, very inexpensive. To answer that question, I would, ask, I would throw a question right back at you and say, if you're pondering that question to yourself, ask yourself this. To whom do I owe what? To whom do I owe what? Sure, you have debts to pay, but I would not encourage. I would not encourage incurring additional debt. I say, find a giant, find a mentor, work for that person, learn as much as you can, be a sponge, get your hands out of your pocket, be a crab, be a perpetual student, then start writing articles, giving lectures, get on the circuit. When you teach something, you have to learn it, and you, you become better, more skilled at it. And eventually, when the debt pairs down, you find what you're passionate about. It doesn't have to be something expensive. You don't have to be an implantologist, aesthetic dentist, which may be more expensive. I do not, not own any of those things uh, that you mentioned. They're all wonderful. I commend the people who do it. I do not own a CAD CAM. My lasers are the inexpensive soft tissue lasers. Uh, I commend people who have the other ones, but I chose not to because my passion happens to not be amongst the more expensive ones. I'm ha very happy with what I do. I see dentists who are very high income and very unhappy. I'm extremely pleased because I'm a big fish on a small, uh, in a small pond. I used to teach at the University of Pennsylvania full time. Uh, I was the, uh, uh, after one year of that, I realized that I didn't have much control or much say. So I gave up being a University of Pennsylvania professor to being a dentist in a small, quiet town where I have more control. I decide what I want to do or what I don't want to do, what I want to buy, what I don't want to buy, what debts I choose to incur. And so I don't have much debt. Uh, sure, you have to pay back your dental school debt, but be above and beyond that, you pare it down, find what you're passionate about, and make an investment in your future. Well said. Very well said. Um, also, I want to ask you, um, <clears throat> a lot of people are saying uh, that come out of school that they're saying, yeah, but Howard, when you got out of school, you know, they didn't have uh, corporate dentistry. And I'm like, actually, they did. When I got out of school in 1987, Orthodontic Centers of America was on the New York Stock Exchange, and there was a oh. dozen of them on NASDAQ. And then after the years went by, they every one of them disappeared. And then there's about a 10-year lull where they really didn't exist. Now they're back. Yeah. Do, you, do, you think they're, do you think they're back like they were the first round and, this, and then what's going to happen to the second round is going to be like the – do you think history is repeating itself or do you think it's different this time? Do you think it's a, it's a different uh, dental economy than it was uh, 40 years ago? I believe uh, that every sword is double-edged. It's not nothing is all good or all bad. The same sword that's used for hurting is used for healing. Same scalpel for hurting for healing. 
the corporate dentistry has advantages, has disadvantages. I choose not to participate in it. I can see that it does have advantages for some people who need it, but I don't advocate it, I don't promote it because I think there are better alternatives to that. And I'm going to say something a little bit arrogant, but I'm going to put it out anyway. Cream rises to the top. If you're good and you're doing good work, you do not need crutches. Corporate dentistry is a great backup or failsafe for those that need it. I myself don't need it and I don't advocate it because we, I have developed a niche where people will come to me whether I'm involved in corporate dentistry or not. So I'm not a proponent of that, although I do see how it would be useful for some people. My, my, my pitch is be good at what, you, uh, what you're doing, become excellent at it, develop your niche, and people will come to you whether you accept their insurance or not, whether you're part of corporate dentistry or not. Because cream will rise to the top. There's not much competition up there. There's a lot of competition way at the bottom where everybody's doing the same thing. There's not much competition if you have set yourself apart from the, uh, the um, your colleagues and competitors. And I want to point out one thing to uh, these kids. You know, when you're thinking about $250,000 in student loans, you're thinking about money, money, and then you're thinking about taking insurance and BBOs. You're thinking about price and all this stuff. Uh, you and I have been around the block to know that all of that flies out the window when you're dealing with fear. And when you go to the market and you have a solution for fear of dentistry, fear of dentistry is as big as uh, finance of dentistry. And, and the other thing that's very lucrative about um, putting you to sleep is every single time I've ever told a patient in, my, in 20 years of dentistry, well, you know, we can put you to sleep. They say, oh, my God, well, if you're going to put me to sleep, do it all. Do the whole thing because they're almost afraid that, this might be their only shot. They, they, they finally met this guy, and they go, if you're going to put me to sleep, oh, my God, do it all. Would you say that your IV sedation cases are bigger than the other dentist's non-IV sedation cases? Because of that reason, they just if you're going to go through all that trouble, just do it all? Well, let me say this. We uh, have excellent records of uh, the income drawn from the office versus putting people to sleep. And – we have confirmed that we quadruple our income without working any faster or harder. We're just working more efficiently. When we're in the operating room, the patients have one-stop shopping. Whether they're a business executive or a lawyer who just wants to have eight hours of work done all in one sitting because he doesn't want to deal with parking spaces or he doesn't want to have needles multiple times. But our income is literally quadrupled. Uh, we've been working six-handed, not four-handed. My two hands, my sterile assistant, and my unsterile assistant, or the hygienist. Everything is six-handed. And from the time the pack goes in the mouth to the time the pack goes out of the mouth, we've cal calibrated the work done relative to the amount of time spent. And it is right now, it's uh, over $3,500 per hour, which is four times what we do in an office setting. I'm not working any faster. I'm like the duck. Above the surface, I'm calm and serene. And nobody knows that below the surface, we're paddling with a frenzy because we're at maximum efficiency. So when somebody wants all the work done while they're asleep, I calibrate how much time it would take me in the office. I divide it by four. That's how much time I allocate. If you present me with a treatment plan and I know it's going to take eight hours in the office, knowing that I might not even finish the case because you're flailing your hands or you're a no-show or whatever, I'll take that eight-hour figure divided by four, and I'm going to give you a two-hour sleep appointment. Now, my only overhead is my assistant's salary and the gas to get from my office to the hospital and back. So if I'm grossing 3500 an hour, let's say even if my overhead is 50%, it's not, I'm going to make that up, could you live with half of $3,500 an hour, knowing that you're not reimbursed for your driving time and the time it takes for you to dictate the case, and then proofread and electronically sign the case. So it is an extraordinary practice builder uh, to accommodate, to treat patients that cannot be treated in your office or anybody else's office. We have, um, we've done 1,600 of these OR cases on patients that would have remained untreated, or they would have gone to an oral surgeon who would have pulled the teeth. I do pull teeth, but I also do fillings, cleaning, saving. I'll do the perio. I'll do the endo. I'm limited only by two things, Howard, my confidence and my competence. Since I'm not a specialist, 
I'm not limited to what I can do. I can do whatever I'm feeling the confidence and the competence to do. If I don't feel confident to do a case, I'll ask an endodontist to join me in the LR just for that one session. We get one day privileges and the endodontist will do the case and then his privileges are suspended by the a close of business that day. And then I'll, I'll proceed to do the core and the crown or whatever else I have to do. And then the follow-up visit to cement the appliances or crown the bridge, et cetera. So it is an extraordinary practice builder without uh, spending one penny of my money other than gas to get to the hospital or surgical center and back. And and I just think that, you know, when you're talking about niche markets, I mean, a lot of people will buy a $75,000 laser because they think they're going to be a laser, laser dentist and that'll be rate marketing or they'll buy a $150,000 CAD CAM machine because they think if they put same day dentistry on their flyer website, that's going to be a huge thing. I think that's a lot of money for a little bang when you're talking about when you say, oh, well, we'll put you to sleep. We'll, we'll do uh, conscious sedation. We have laughing gas and we'll give you a pill. I, I think that market is huge. I, I think that market's about the same size as the ones who just uh, just it, it's only about money, price. They want HMO, PPO, you know, price, price, price. Fear is huge, and you you keep eloquently saying you don't have to buy any expensive toys. You just got to spend a lot of time training, and it, it's a huge market. Fear is irrational. Um, I, I I have a um, I I know people who uh, have families. There's this one family friend of mine. And um, no, one, no one will uh, – they can't have any functions at their friend's house because mm-hmm. one of the siblings' wives thinks there's a ghost in the house. And it's like – I mean she totally believes it. And, and fear – you, have you ever thought about where fear of dentistry comes from? Where, where, because these, these people are very irrational, and, mm-hmm. and they'll drive an hour if they think someone will solve yeah. their irrational. Where, where do you think all this dental fear and anxiety comes from? Well, there are two categories of fear, Howard, fear of the known and fear of the unknown. Fear of the known is somebody who had a bad experience years ago, and that experience stays with them. Maybe as a child, somebody held them down, and now they're an adult, and they still have that fear of the known, where they have a bad memory to draw upon. And then there's fear of the unknown. You don't know what you don't know, uh, but you're afraid that something bad might happen if you lose control, lose consciousness, or put to sleep, or your big brother told you to be afraid. Uh, and we can combat both fear of the known and the unknown the same way. We give them some medicine to relax them, come in on an empty stomach, empty bladder. We'll wrap you if we think you're going to flail your hands or hurt somebody. Uh, you give you some nitrous oxide. And 96% of the time, the work gets done. If you want it done with assurance that all the work will be done in one sitting while you take a nap, I'll meet you at the surgical center or the hospital, take a nap. When you wake up, we are done. You've got your work done successfully. You weren't held or restrained, uh, no psychological repercussions. There was no fear, known or unknown or otherwise. And we made a good living because we just quadrupled our income for that time interval. And it's a win-win for everybody. However, one out of three people in this country don't go to the dentist because of fear and or finance. And if we can overcome either of those barriers, you're talking about one-sixth of the country's population. You're going to have to hire extra staff to see all the people that would come in if you just opened your doors a crack. So now when you do oral sedation and you do nitrous oxide, um, do you charge an extra fee for that? Or are you making your money off the root canal filling, crown cleanings, whatever, or is that a separate fee? Okay, excellent question. So, uh, let me give you a two-part answer, directly and indirectly. Directly, we do charge $4 per minute for the nitrous oxide flow. For the time we turn on the gas, for the time we turn it off, we have the flow meter running at $4 a minute. Uh, whether insurance pays for it or not, the patient does agree to pay the $4 per minute. So on a one-hour case, it's 60 times $4. So we'll, you know, we'll tack on $240 to the cost of the treatment itself. I choose not to charge for uh, prescriptions. Uh, and some people charge a flat fee. I just choose to charge $4 a minute. That's direct. Indirectly, I have a better answer. The word of mouth gives me 900 new patients a year with a zero advertising budget. They go home and imagine what they tell people at the dinner table, people at work the next day. They said, I got my dental work done yesterday. He said, but I thought you were afraid to go. I said, yeah, but I went to Dr. Levy who gave me some pills and then laughing gas and and I was so relaxed. At the end of the case, I said, when are you going to start? He told me we're all done. Or I went to the hospital. Uh, My wife drove me home. 
and now I'm at work the next day. All the work was done while I was sedated or asleep. Look at the income drawn by 900 new patients with a zero advertising budget. We are starting to use Solution Reach, which is helping us, but I'm not going to consider that part of my uh, marketing <coughs> at, this, at this point because it's word of mouth that's getting me all these new, new patients. Well, that is amazing, and that is one hour. We just hit the one-hour deadline, and, I mean, your resume is a who's who of dentistry. I mean, uh, gosh, uh, the AGD gave you the Humanitarian Award, the ADA, the Access to Care Award, the Maryland's Governor Doctor of the Year Award, the Maryland State Dental Association's first Humanitarian Award, Special Care Dentistry Saul Cayman Award. I mean, you even were running the 2002 Olympic Torch you have nine black belts inducted in the U.S. Martial Arts Hall of Fame. Seriously, dude, you are amazing. You are amazing. And you know what? Seriously, um, we, we just hit 200,000 members on Dentaltown. And uh, we just passed uh, um, 35,000 download the Dentaltown app. I wish you would uh, find a way to put one of your courses on Dentaltown just because I'm, I'm going to turn about 7,000 people on you today. I, I think if you put an online C course, more people, because more people should get to know you. More people should listen to you. Seriously, dude, thank you for everything you've done for dentistry. Uh, you're just an amazing guy, and it's an honor that you spent an hour with me today. Well, Howard, I've been admiring you unofficially before 2009 and personally since 2009. You're one of my role models, and I admire what you do. You provide a tremendous service to the dental community, and I respect that, and I'm a fan of yours. And I, and, I don't, and I don't ever want to cross you because uh, me and my four boys, we all wrestled through high school. I, I did a, a Bishop Carroll, and, I, and all, my, all four of my boys, we're, we're a wrestling family. And uh, wrestlers know one thing. They don't want to mix it up with a karate guy. So, uh, <laughs> but, hey, thanks again for all you do, and uh, I hope to see you on uh, Dental Town someday. Email me and Linda Neeson. And, and, uh, and by the way, any, anybody listening, uh, you can always email me, Howard, at Dentaltown.com. And if not, I will see you on the boards. Thanks, Harvey. Thank you, Howard, for the pleasure and the opportunity to share. All right. Bye-bye.